And good morning. So growing up as a pastor's kid, I attended a lot of vacation Bible schools. We had felt boards. Some of y'all don't know what those are. We had music time with tambourines and maracas. Father Abraham, how many, right? Or Zacchaeus was a, okay, there you go, right? Some of y'all are terrified because you didn't do that and you're like, what is happening, right? Snack time, animal crackers, juice box, yeah. Uh, Then uh, the puppets would come out. And let's be honest, the puppets were creepy, all right? I'm just going to be honest with you this morning. Uh, But then on the last day, uh, it was the let's scare the hell out of you moment. Uh, Now, I'm I'm sort of joking, but not really. Uh, It would be a moment where it would be this conversation. You don't want to go to hell, do you? It's terrible. It's awful. And time and time again, I see that happen often. That's the conversation that we have when it comes to following Jesus. For a lot of people, it's a get out of hell free card. That if you choose to follow Jesus and say the sinner's prayer, you're saved. And what would happen at VBS is they would scare you and you would make the decision and then it would basically be, congrats, Uh, now pray some and read your Bible. It wasn't a ton of follow-up, and I'm probably over-exaggerating that. And as a kid, I probably missed out on a lot of the things that they challenged me to do. But the reality was, it was more so, hey, say this prayer, you're not going to hell, go about your life. But I, I was blessed to grow up with parents who challenged me and actually helped me to practice the way of Jesus to see the decision to follow Jesus as more than just a get out of hell moment. But if we're being honest this morning, a lot of people when it comes to a relationship with Jesus, that's what it is. It's a get out of hell, I don't have to go there. And if you ask a lot of people, they will tell you they are Christian. But then they begin to define what Christianity means and it kinda doesn't add up or follow what the Bible teaches. See, being a Christian is more than just simply praying a prayer to save you from going to hell. It's a new way of life. It's a better way of life. It's a better way of life that we could ever create for ourselves, but it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost of surrender, surrendering to your desires and to pursue his desires, surrendering all of your life to him. Jerry Bridges writes a book called The Pursuit of Holiness. Yeah, Tyler is not the only pastor who reads. Uh, And uh, in his book, he says this. He says, the whole purpose of salvation is that we be holy and blameless in his sight, Ephesians 1.4. To continue to live in sin as a Christian is to go contrary to God's very purpose for for our salvation. So before we jump into the text today, I want to change it up a little bit, if that's okay. Usually the invitation comes at the end of the message, but not today. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you given your life to him? And I'm not talking about saying a prayer that saves you from going to hell. I'm talking about a fully surrendered life to Jesus as king of your life. And if you're sitting there and you've answered that question, yes, I'm so excited. And I'm excited to walk through the next few verses of 1 Peter with you. And my prayer is that as we explore those verses together, that God would convict you of things in your life that don't look like him. That he would lovingly reveal areas in your life that that you need to repent of and change. And that ultimately today, that God through his Holy Spirit would speak to you and help you look more like him, more so than when you came in today. But maybe you're sitting there today and you don't know if you've surrendered your life to Jesus. Or maybe you know you have not surrendered your life to Jesus. The invitation is out there for you. It's an invitation to give up your desires and to pursue his, to daily deny yourself and to surrender. It is a call to pursue your creator, not out of obligation, but out of adoration for who he is and what he has done for you. 
See, you and I, we were born into sin and left on our own, we were dead. And we can't experience the life we were created. And we see the effects of sin all around us, selfishness, hate, sickness, lack of purpose, lack of self-worth. Sin is ugly and destructive. And you may have seen it rear its ugly head with your family or maybe at school through bullying, maybe even here at the church. There is no human where sin has not corrupted. And it sucks. And every day we are tempted to allow it to control our lives and to ruin our lives. Sin is powerful. A lot of times way more powerful than we give it credit for. And we like to justify our sin, excuse our sin. We like to ignore it. But the reality is, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you and I naturally will choose this path unless we recognize and remind ourselves of the good news. Romans 5.8 says this, that God demonstrates his love towards us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus was born. He lived a perfect life. Then he died and rose again, redeeming our relationship with God through the shedding of his blood. And by trusting in him, his death and resurrection, we now have a new identity, a new way of thinking, a new way of life. Deciding to trust Jesus isn't just I don't have to go to hell anymore mindset. It is I am not my own. I am surrendering everything to him. It's an invitation to you to discover your identity. It's an invitation to you to leave the kingdom of darkness and enter the kingdom of light. It's an invitation to find your purpose and meaning. It's an invitation to walk in the best version of yourself. My question to get us started this morning is that if you have not made that decision, why not? What's keeping you from going all in with him? Because if you want to make that decision, you can. Right here, right now. And if you aren't ready, that's okay. We have people that would love to talk to you and answer any questions that you might have. See, following Jesus is the most important decision that you could ever make in your entire life. You are surrendering your life to the one who loves you far greater than anybody else ever could. The one who created you and knows you better than you know yourself. So what better person to surrender to? See, I surrendered my life to Jesus 29 years ago. And I'm telling you, it was the best decision I've ever made. Amen. And I, I can tell you ahead of time, life's not going to be perfect. But I have someone that walks with me through life and will never fail me. And let me just ask you, if, if everyone, I know this is weird because we're supposed to be doing this after everything. But in this moment right now, if everyone could just bow your head and close your eyes, and if you're a follower of Jesus in this room, I want you to begin to pray for the people to your left and to your right, to the people in front of you, to the people behind you. Because I believe there's people in this room that haven't surrendered their life to Jesus. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is working in this moment, and he's drawing people to himself. And if you're sitting here in this moment and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus and you want to, simply ask him. Ask him to forgive you, to save you. Declare that you believe he died and rose again so that you could have life. Tell him that you surrender your whole life to him. Confess with your mouth that he is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Jesus, right here in this moment, you are a miracle worker. You take things that are dead and you bring them to life. And so in this moment, speak to the hearts of the people in this room. For the ones that have surrendered their life to you today, I pray that they would feel a sense of calling and purpose and meaning. That your Holy Spirit would speak to them in the next few moments. God, thank you for the grace that you pour out to us freely. Jesus, we love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, if you made that decision today, tell us. Please tell us. There's a card in front of you you can fill out. There's a Connect Center where you can stop because what we want to do is help you walk with Jesus. We want to help you in the way of Jesus. 
And for me, the longer I've been a Christian, the more I'm realizing just how much daily I need to be reminded of that good news of the gospel. We say it often, we need to preach the good news, the gospel to ourselves daily. See, I was dead in my sin. I was lost. I had no hope. I had struggled with worth and value, but then I surrendered to Jesus and it changed my life. I found purpose and forgiveness and love, and I found the reason I exist on this planet, my true identity. And that's what we saw last week as we kicked off a brand new series in 1 Peter. We saw in 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12, that that Peter talks about the new identity that we can have in Christ. 1 Peter 1, 3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, we have been given life, and that life isn't just for after this life. The life that we has, have been given was meant to start in the here and the now. What we said earlier, surrendering to Jesus is not about just going to heaven. It's about bringing heaven to earth. It's about living a life set apart that looks different so that the world around us would take note. It's about living a life like the person who gave his life for you. But here's the tension and where it lies in the now and not yet. We long for the day where we get to spend eternity with God, but we live in now. We long for the day where everything will be made new and everyone will submit to the authority of Jesus, but we live in a time and culture where it completely seems opposite. And this isn't far off from where the audience that Peter was writing to was in. The way of Jesus went against their culture their gods, their beliefs as well. And that's why what we're talking about today is so important. And that's why Peter spends so much time in his letter reminding us over and over again who we are and whose we are. And so let's pick up where we left off and listen to the next few verses of 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 14. As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. See, to be holy means to be set apart for a purpose, be uniquely different. Holiness matters because if there's nothing different about us, then by implication, there's nothing different about us. Jesus. Why would Christians go through persecution, sacrifice, be different, live differently? If it didn't matter, if it wasn't different. But the reality is, Jesus is better. Pursuing his lifestyle is better, and we know this. But often we struggle to live it out. We often like to pick and choose the part of the lifestyle of Jesus we like. Or the parts of the Bible that we really like and some we just don't really like, so we kind of ignore it. Like, I'll have my quiet time and I'll pray before my meals. That's easy. Sexual purity? I mean, well, everybody else is sleeping with their girlfriends and boyfriends or looking at porn and they seem okay. So, like, God will forgive me, right? Or I I need to pray for those who persecute me and hurt me. Uh, It depends on the day, right? Uh, If I feel like it, uh, I'll, I'll do that. We begin to compromise. We begin to justify, and then we struggle to live out this lifestyle of Jesus. And it's super hard because we live in the now where pursuing this lifestyle and the teachings of Jesus is completely counter culture, right? We don't want to be the weird Christian in our friend group or at work. And this is the audience that Paul was writing to and what they were dealing with. Can I just pause for a second? This book is as relevant today as it was 1,000 years ago, and we need to be in it every single day. Okay, unpause, sorry. Peter tells us that we are to be holy and that following Jesus is actually a pursuit of holiness. This can look different for a lot of different people, and sometimes it can even turn into things that it's actually not, or at least it shouldn't be. 
See, the pursuit of holiness is about having the right heart and about having the right motive. But sometimes the pursuit of holiness can actually look like this, obligation. Like, I have to do this. I, 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 I have to do this. And, and when we see it as obligation, what happens is it becomes a checklist. Do this, don't do that. I see this all the time with students. Uh, um, you know, following Jesus just isn't fun. There's too many rules that I have to follow. And, if, you know, I, I just don't like it. But what will happen is we will naturally resist holiness as long as we view it as an obligation. Now, we are commanded to be holy as he is holy, which we'll see shortly. But having the right mind and heart as we approach this is crucial. But some of us go another route, and we see holiness not as obligation, but actually as guilt. I, I mean, I, I messed up so many times. I, 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 I kind of feel bad. I got to get God to like me again. I, I'm, such a, I'm such a bad person. I have to earn God's favor. I have to earn his love. And I have to please him because he's surely disappointed in me. Man, that word there. Anybody ever grow up and your parents say that? Like, I'm not mad at you. I'm just disappointed in you, right? That's the worst, and it feels weighty. And what happens is we think God views us that way. So what do we do? We combat that by trying to do good to earn his favor and to earn his love. Still others pursue holiness not out of obligation or guilt, but out of blessings. If I do good... I'm going to get all the money, life's going to be great, it's going to be perfect. And so I'm going to pursue that lifestyle, why? So I can get and gain. Man, if I act right, God will bless me. If I do the right things, blessings will follow. If I'm following Jesus, no issues, no problems, life will be great. But as we saw last week, and if you read any of 1 Peter, that's just not the case. And Paul said it last week, God's plan for your life is that your faith in him would be tested by hardship. And that's actually a good thing. But still others will sometimes see the pursuit of holiness as optional. If I like it, I'll do it. If I don't, I won't. If I agree with it, if it fits my narrative, if it fits my story, then great. If not, I'll just kind of bypass it or find an excuse for it. I can justify it. I'm not as bad as the person beside me. Or I just had a rough day, and so it is what it is. But when we approach holiness from any of those perspectives, it's very me-centric. Very me-centric. But listen again to how Peter approaches holiness. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy. Why? For I am holy. God is holy. Instead of coming at it from my perspective, We are to approach it from God's perspective. He is holy, therefore we should be holy. Now I'm not saying you are to be perfect. No one is perfect. But what I am saying is that we are to strive with everything in us to try to be more like Jesus. Bridges writes this, God does not require a perfect sinless life to have fellowship with him. But he does require that we be serious about holiness, that we grieve over sin in our lives instead of justifying it, that we earnestly pursue holiness as a way of life. So if holiness and the pursuit of it isn't about obligation or guilt, blessing or something that's optional, what is it about? It's about the one who is holy. It's about Jesus. He's set apart. There is none like him. He is in a league of his own, and if he is holy, we are to pursue holiness. So I want to give you a couple foundational truths about holiness. So instead of looking at holiness out of obligation, we are to look at holiness out of adoration. Instead of obligation, it's out of 
adoration. We pursue the lifestyle of Jesus, which is mark number two here at Seven Marks, out of a deep love and a deep respect for Jesus. Listen to 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen to what Peter says. Therefore, right? If there are any students in the room, you know what I'm about to say. If you see a therefore, know what it's there for. Because of your identity, because of who you are, your new life in Christ, a deep respect and love for him, this is how you're supposed to live. This is how you're supposed to conduct yourself. Why are we called to personal holiness? Because we have surrendered to the holy of holies. And our lives are to look like him, and for that we need his help. And he has given us help through his Holy Spirit. If we every day began to surrender our lives to him daily, then we have a better chance throughout the day of living a life holy that looks more like him. And when we do that, we actually operate and walk in the way we were meant to. And everyone around us wins, our family, our friends, our classmates, neighbors, coworkers, everyone we come in contact with benefits from this. We are literally the best version of ourselves when we're walking closely with Jesus. See, we are called to personal holiness because we are called to look like Jesus. Our standard for holiness is him. It's not the people around us. It's Jesus. And what often we do is we compare. But Peter says, hey, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Hey, guys, don't live like you used to. Don't do it. Surrender to your desires by surrendering to Jesus' desires. Conform to his image. But as we said, back then it was tough. And today that's still tough because we live in a culture that that's not highly looked upon. Everyone can decide for themselves their truth, what is right. And if people don't agree with you, you just say, peace out, I'll find someone else who does, and I'll walk with them. We've seen this time and time, even from the very beginning. I recently saw this clip by Jackie Hill Perry, and I think she just nails it on the head. Take a look at this. Have you ever thought about how Eve sees good things in the thing God said would kill her? problem is, it didn't matter how good the tree looked. What mattered is what God said about it. So let's get practical. We are in a culture that will make you believe that you have the right to decide what goodness is. That if it's fun, it must be good. If it's pleasurable, it must be good. If it, if it doesn't harm anybody, it must be good. What if it harms God? We never ask that question. What, what if it grieves God's spirit? And the problem is that the only person in heaven and on earth who has the right, the authority to decide what is good and what isn't good is God. Why? Because he's God. Also because he's good. We have... A good father that is holy and set apart, that is loving and kind and desires that you have the life that you are created for. He isn't up there telling you how disappointed he is, and he's not guilting you into being like him. So instead of this pursuit of holiness out of guilt, let's pursue holiness out of gratitude. Out of gratitude, striving to be like him out of the sacrifice that he made for us. Take a look at 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21. It says this. It says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world and was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Did you hear the language there? You were ransomed. 
There was a payment made for you. You were loved by him and bought by his precious blood out of gratitude for what he has done. We are to pursue holiness. Listen to what Jade uh, Mazarine says. She says this, God does not identify us by our sins. It's almost as he sees uh, the, other thing, the other way around. While we might magnify our mistakes, God magnifies the beauty given to us. When we feel guilty or perceive God as sternly pointing out our faults, perhaps we can recognize it is just our voices or the enemies. We can choose instead to listen to his choir voice that tenderly repeats, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. We can recognize that God is a God of deep compassion, Does this mean we overlook sin? Not at all. When we see issues in our lives, we are asked to take them seriously, to present them in ourselves to the only one who is able to help us, teach us, grow us into his likeness. After all, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is not disappointed in you. He is far from it. Don't operate out of a place of guilt, but out of a place of gratitude. Next, instead of pursuing holiness for blessing, we pursue holiness to be a blessing. To be a blessing. And what we see in the next few verses as chapter 1 comes to a conclusion and we enter chapter 2 is this continuation of the pursuit of personal holiness. You are to obey God, be holy because God is holy, live righteous lives. And such holiness will not only help operate in the best version of yourself, but it will also serve as a convincing demonstration to everyone around you of God's salvation. And their lives then are a means of evangelism. See, here at Seven Marks, we use this acronym called BLESS. It's a tool the way we can love people and begin to pray for people and share the good news of Jesus with them. And so the B simply stands for be in prayer. Like even right now, maybe someone's coming to your head that you need to share the good news of Jesus to. Begin praying for that person. Pray for them every single day. Maybe it's someone you don't like. Start praying for them daily and see what happens, right? And then listen to them. Find an opportunity to take them to coffee or to be around them. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a friend at school. Actually be quiet and let them talk. See where they're at, their story, their background, where they're coming from, where they are in life. And then eat with them. Yes, eat with them. Some of the best conversations happen around the table where you're sharing a meal. And then as you hear them and listen to them, you will find ways to serve them. How can you serve them Be in their lives and show them the goodness of who God is by loving them well. And then that gives you the ability to share with them. By showing that you care, by investing in your life, by actually stop talking and listening, you show them that you genuinely care about them. And this is a simple way that you can can love people and share the goodness of God with them. And when you're walking with Jesus and pursuing his lifestyle... What you find is holiness, a life that looks different, a life that actually brings blessing to others. Because when we walk with him, everyone around us benefits. We're more patient. We're more kind. We're loving. We're forgiving. And it looks vastly different from the world in which we live in. As I mentioned earlier, it's not going to seem fun on a Tuesday standing up for your faith. Or it might not seem easy to respond to the Holy Spirit in sharing the gospel with a neighbor or a coworker, And it's going to be really hard to go against the culture that we live in. But we don't do it because we are holier than thou. We don't do it because we are better than anybody, because we pity those who don't believe what we believe. We do it because his way is better. His lifestyle is better. It's worth the cost. It's worth giving our lives to show people around us that Jesus' way is better. See, we want to offer them a better way of life, and that comes through a supernatural love that God has given to us. See, Peter urges us to pursue holiness, to be set apart, By abstaining from the passions of the flesh, which are actually super destructive, 
and to conduct ourselves honorably. I'm responsible for me. I'm not responsible for the people around me, how people treat me, how others act. I'm responsible for me, and I am to pursue a life of holiness. Why? So others take note. Listen to what he says in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says this. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. They actually wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of salvation. That sounds a little familiar. You can see in this moment Peter living out his time with Jesus and repeating Jesus' very words that we see in Matthew 5, 16. They may see your good deeds, but glorify God. It's not about us. It's about him. And if we would live out the lifestyle of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, people will take notice. And only will people take notice, you will discover your true purpose and meaning. And now I'll get to the hard part. Hard part about being a pastor, hard part about being a follower, I can't do it for you. I can't do this for you. This is a choice. The ball is in your court. You have the power to choose to be obedient or to disobey. But I think the command's clear. First Peter tells us, as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. See, we aren't supposed to pursue holiness as optional, but as obedience. As obedience. Our ultimate goal in the pursuit of holiness, living in the lifestyle of Jesus, is to fulfill our purpose on this planet, which is to bring God glory. And that comes through obedience to him, surrendering our lives to his will and his way. See, one day, everyone will submit to God, whether they want to or not. But until that happens, it's your choice. It's your choice. And my prayer is that we would see obedience, not as uh, optional, but as a joy and honor and privilege, that we would pursue this life of holiness, which is ultimately a pursuit of Jesus. Choosing to surrender to Jesus is synonymous with choosing a life of holiness. It's a choice, a response that grows out of a deep love for him because when we see him as holy, our response is our lives. Our response is a life of obedience. And as I was prepping for today, Revelation chapter 4 came to mind, and Scripture helps us to give a beautiful picture of the not yet. And so today what I want to do to kind of end is look at the throne room of heaven, where the holy of holies is seated, and where day after day, People are crying, holy, holy, holy. They're falling down. They're casting crowns because we live in the now. And sometimes it's hard for us to picture the not yet. And we live in the now, and sometimes it clouds us and, and, and downplays the holiness of the God that we serve. But we have a holy God who's set apart, who's called us to be set apart. Not for us, but for him. And when we do that, people take notice. And my prayer is that as we look at the holiness of God in Revelation 4, that our lives would begin to mimic this. And not only that, but we would respond with all of creation in declaring the holiness of our God. Would you stand with me for a second? Revelation chapter 4, we see John writes this. And after this, I looked. Behold, a door was standing open in heaven. And the voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. 
And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper, Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had an appearance of emerald. And around the throne there are 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders. They were clothed in white garments with crowns, golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder. And before the throne there were burning seven torches of fire, which the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there were seas of glass like crystal. And around the throne, And on each side of the throne, there are four living creatures, full of eyes in the front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the second like an ox, the third living creature like a face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes and all around within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who seated on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever and they cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. 